Right, good morning everybody. Thank you to everybody who has come this morning. Um, it's amazing actually to see a full room of people. I've got my little supporters dotted all over here. So I reckon half of the room is filled up with them. But thank you for that. That's um, good to, to have. Just to say that we are recording this um, this morning. But when we get to question time at half 12, that won't be recorded. OK, for the conversation piece there. Um, and I guess just to start off as well is to thank um, Professor Gavin Davidson for providing this room and tea and coffee and everything for this conversation. It's certainly, I think, a very appropriate place to be having this kind of critical conversation in a university. So I really appreciate that, Gavin. And of course, it's just fabulous to have Professor John Reed over. Him and I have been on Zoom for, I think, about three years, and we met going into the BBC studio to go on air. That was our first meeting with no brief. Um, and he was much taller than I remember him and much smarter than I remember him on Zoom. <laughs> so it's, it's just such a privilege. John has been doing this work for over 40 years, and I have been in the service for nearly that same length of time. So it's a particular um, privilege and honor really to have him have him over and so humble. Um, so yeah, just lovely to have you here, John. Um, just to, to start off with, um, I do this in training, but I'm doing it, I do this anyway. It's just, I certainly have to take a breath here um, and just ground myself a little bit. I've got my stones here and my bits and pieces that, that help me remember that. Um, but also just for yourselves, just to check in, you know, with, with where you're at. Um, and yeah, just to say as well that to be as present as fully as possible, this, this is a, a challenging conversation to have. Um, and I will be, I don't usually, um, you know, I was saying when I was preparing for this, I usually do my training and I love doing training and I'm very comfortable with that. Or I do public speaking and I've got a format for that that I do and I'm comfortable with that. And this is neither of those things. So I'm not actually 100% sure what I'm doing this morning. But anyway, it's come together in some format or another. So, so bear with me. Um, and some of the content is challenging. We will be talking about suicide, self-harm, violence against women, um, and ECT. And these, these um, topics can impact everybody. And I don't usually talk about it to the extent that I will be today, but it's appropriate for this, this presentation. So in terms of that, with checking in with yourself, if you need to get up and leave at any point, that's perfectly okay. No judgments. And also, sometimes we can hear things, you know, that can just raise some emotions in us. Um, the number of people who have been impacted by ECT who have spoken to me, have never told anybody about it, but also the wider issues that I'll be speaking about, it can sometimes just touch us in ways, and emotions are actually okay, you know? So you don't have to leave because you feel an emotion, um, but please do take that space if you do, and, and even if you don't want to come back, it's, it's all about choice, this, um, yeah. Also, this attending to your own inner teacher and practicing that both and thinking, you know, while we're talking, it is about checking in with how is this sitting with my experience, you know, with what I know about people I'm working with for myself, um, people in my family, um, and that both and thinking, I know this is a controversial issue as well, but it is about that thinking, can I hold this information and can I also hold this? which maybe don't align always, but just holding it to have, my, my therapist teaches me this, holding things in both hands, you know, that sometimes don't sit with, with what we know. And certainly what I'm talking about today, I couldn't have talked about seven years ago because I didn't know anything about it. And I couldn't have talked about it six months ago because I wouldn't have been ready to talk about it. Um, so I just invite you to do that. And then that observing deep confidentiality, nobody can guarantee, and this is being recorded because I want it as a resource, um, but that confidentiality can just sometimes be about respect for people's dignity who are speaking. And the way that we talk about this is really important. Um, and there is a break where there will be scones 
and tea and coffee and things. So uh, we'll all be needing a sugar top up then. Um, and just to explain to you a bit about how this morning is going to work. Um, and I'm very delighted. I'm also here with two hats on. So I'm here in the context of my own business, Lisa Morrison Training and Consultancy. I also work two days with PPR, um, Participation and Practice of Rights. Sarah's going to speak more about that. And, and a number of activists are here this morning. And the new script is, is ac exactly what um, aligns with what I intended when I started out um, with my work. And so it is an honor and a privilege to be part of this movement, um, this social movement, which is for everybody. So Sarah's going to talk a bit of just about the evolution of the campaign very briefly. And very delighted um, and honored to have Deirdre, one of the activists here with us this morning, who's going to share um, a poem with you. I am linking this conversation to violence against women and girls. Tomorrow is International Women's Day, and I believe that ECT is the tip of the iceberg in terms of this. Um, that's not to take away from other people's issues or um, men who have been in the system and experienced this, but I'm focusing specifically around my experience um, with this issue. I'm then going to do probably a 40, 45 minute presentation called Holding Hope Lightly. Um, then there'll be tea, coffee and scones and Mags, one of our activists as well, is going to be available here just for anybody who wants a five minute grounding and because some of the content that I'll be sharing will be quite, but that's optional for you. Um, she, she does some somatic work, but it's just really a, a grounding activity for anybody who wants that before they go for tea or coffee. And then um, John is going to be doing his presentation after coffee, um, talking you through the, the history and the research. Um, and then we'll have half an hour for a conversation, question time, what we are asking from this, and also about next steps and how you can get involved in the new script. So does that all sound okay? Anyway, you're all here, so it, it, it must be okay. So Sarah, can I hand over to you for now? Good morning everyone. It's just great to see so many people here today. We had an event up in Stormont yesterday in the Long Gallery with Professor Reid and a new script for mental health and again that, that was just a fabulous day. Just facing more and more people, there's a hunger for having conversations and this is really what a lot of this is about, is just opening up space for us all to have critical, respectful conversations around uh, mental health and what's working, what's not working, what the evidence is telling us and where we should be going um, and, and working all of that out together. So it's, it's, it's lovely to be in this room with everybody this morning. As Lisa said, I work with uh, PPR, it's a human rights organisation set up back after the Good Friday Belfast Peace Agreement uh, in the early 2000s by Ines McCormick, who is a formidable um, leader, uh, trade union leader, um, peace activist, organiser, um, and I just set up PPR really to look at the peace agreement and to look at the human rights and equality provisions which she and others fought so hard to get into that agreement to see were they going to make any difference to people's lives you know all of the sort of things written down in, the, in, in black and white in the agreement were they had they any teeth and would they change things for people in their everyday lives but particularly people who need human rights protections the most so social economic rights protections like right to housing right to health um, and that's the starting point for the mental health campaign, which was started by families, families who've been bereaved by suicide, families struggling to get uh, timely and appropriate um, support for themselves and, and, and their loved ones. And like, like all good things, in the, in the years since, it has evolved and moved on a journey, and I think you, you had a journey up there, Lisa, but it's very much on, on a journey and constantly doing and learning from, from what we're doing. So just give you a little sense of the campaign. Um, it's quite important just to share with the PPR as an organization doesn't take any state funding. Because we're a human rights organization holding the state to account, it's very important for us as a principle that we, we, we don't, we're, we're, we are, our job as we see it is to hold the state to account. Um, so that's that's why we don't, don't take government funding. Um, so in those early days, I said the focus was very much on suicide prevention, support for families who've been bereaved. Um, we did 
Oh, we've always worked with the UN level. In the very top corner there, um, on the left, Bertie uh, and Juby on the right from the Shankill and the Shore Road, and Marissa from New Lodge, along with um, two of the committee members in the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Committee in, in, in the UN. Um, so we've always used human rights tools to shine a light. So it's a combination of sort of community organizing, using trade union uh, tools and tactics, along with human rights-based um, accountability. Um, big campaign that the picture dropped down into the public health agency, the Health Social Care Board as it was, around access to counselling and trying to improve access to counselling. Um, an open letter in the paper around suicide prevention. Um, so, but over the years with all of the campaigns, I think the learning for us was that um, families were coming together trying to fix bits of the system and increasingly realising this is huge, you know, we fix one bit maybe around waiting times or getting a bit of extra funding in for counselling, we were talking about earlier, Brian, but you know, you did that and you took your eye off the ball and you went somewhere else and just, I think, over all those 15 years, so we've seen something different, there's something of a different magnitude or measure, but coming from a different place as well. Yes, we were successful in, you know, getting advancements in those issues that people campaigned on. It was exhausting for people. People were burnt out. But because we were beginning to realize that this is a systemic problem, this, these are not individual bits of a system, that if we fix, everything will be, be fine. I think the learning from families who've been bereaved, who've really experienced dreadful loss and, 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 and pain and injustice in the system was that something different needs to happen here. So we, we got to sort of a COVID, and I'll just flip on here and then start. And, and, and this was the other learning for us, was just around the systemic thing, that this is underneath this, it's really around inequality. Um, and it's the structural thing again, it's around inequality, uh, uh, poverty driving that. So when you look at things like the data on anti, um, antidepressant prescribing or rates of suicide, all the evidence is these, it's not coincidence or chance that these things are at least three times higher in, in the poorest areas. Um, we know the rates for antidepressant prescribing here, one in five of the population, but in areas like Derry, the Shankill, the Falls, it's at least one in four. And when you go with older women, the data seems to say it's up as much as one in two people you know, that are on antidepressants. So we're, we're medicalizing distress. Um, and the same for the rates of suicide. The gap is widening the, ga in, in the deaths by suicide. The inequality gap in the poorest and, and richest areas, the gap is widening. So something is not working in the strategies that we have. Um, so we got to a point where, with COVID hitting, just before it, we had the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health, uh, Professor Daniel Puris, over up in the Spectrum Centre in the Shankill Road. And really we took so much out of you know, what he was saying and he's, he's done so much work in this area and I would encourage people to look at the papers he's produced, we have them on our website. But he was saying that when you boil a lot of it down, we need to move the dial away from looking at chemical imbalance, which has now been just proven that it doesn't exist, the chemical imbalance in people's brains, and start thinking about power imbalance within society. Um, and we'll share these, we can share these slides as well with people, so if you want to for the quotes and that. So that gave us real pause for thought and then during COVID we had that time and we were thinking about the things that, that the United Nations and the World Health Organization were saying that this is about power, it's about the dominance of a particular model, a biomedical model, and it's about the asymmetries of power, you know, that, that there's a real, um, yeah, the power differential between people who need the, the, the services and people on the ground and communities and the people who have the power to decide what, 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 what is, being, is being provided. And also the biased use of knowledge and evidence. And I know that's something that Professor Reid has done a, a lot of, of work and commentary on. From all of that, we got to last February with the 1st of February inbox in Bridges Day and we launched uh, this called New Script for Mental Health. The campaigners who've been there all along, coming through all of their knowledge and wisdom and really hard earned, kind of saying that this is something different that's needed. So this is the new script for mental health. And I guess what, what it is, is what I said at the start, it's an opening of a conversation saying, we know the existing system isn't working and that's known the world over. You know, it's the frozen status quo as the UN has called it. What can we do here? But rather than us as a campaign saying, X, Y, and Z is what's needed, and will you agree with us? We're saying, no, let's have conversations everywhere we can around, well, what isn't working and why isn't it working, but imagining something different and better, and that's essentially what New Script is. Um, and 
we do work in different ways. We organise ourselves. We still do the human rights work, which is holding government to account um, around failures, really serious, and with catastrophic um, implications for families and impacts on families, losing loved ones. So holding to account for failures in the system, uh, failures of oversight, particularly the RQIA and their failure to regulate mental health services for 14 years, and nothing much seems to have uh, moved on in that regard. Um, the, the lack of transparency, I guess, the, the huge lack of mental health data, it's an absolute uh, scandal here. We have hardly any mental health data in Northern Ireland compared with England and, and other places. And England, you know, people will tell you it's not good, but by comparison with here. So uh, we're doing a lot of work on accountability. We're building, the, the main thing we're doing, which is what today is part of it, building a movement, bringing people into conversation in different ways through these events, Curious Minds. We're partnered with a, an Irish language organization, Rona to put on this series of, of, of talks. Um, and then the other bit we do is called Collective Care. Um, and Lisa, you know, at the start, you can see that for us, um, we know we need to take care of ourselves and each other and all of us having these conversations and doing this work but in a collective way. So that's, we organize around all of that. There's an invitation to everybody here. You put your name on the mailing list, you'll find out more about the campaign, but we really would love to, uh, people get involved <coughs> in different ways. Um, just run through these, there's some pictures. That's Professor Bill Sweet from Queens here, who's helping us with the accountability work. And um, Paul Herbert, his nephew Gareth, who've been in the news a lot, trying to get accountability for the lack of care for Gareth and get the RQIA to, to, to do their job. And there's just a few pictures of some of our um, alternatives. We do a lot of um, music, drama, dance, creative writing, um, our poetry, a pocket throughout the beach at Helens Bay. And that's some, some pictures of our collective care. The campaign won a national award just before Christmas uh, down in the Europa, so that was a real uh, tribute and recognition of the work that's happening. And Siobhan and Ke Kenny doing the, the nails, the collective, collective care. And, some dance happening over here. Um, so that's that's just to give you a bit of a very quick run through and overview of the campaign. Our website, we do keep it updated and social media, so there's lots more information if you're interested to, to go, go and have a look. That's okay. Thank you. Um, Hand so, up. Yeah, so I'll invite Deirdre up then. As uh, Lisa said, Deirdre is one of the activists, and we're really delighted that and this beautiful. Um, picture here and stand at the back as well. The activists, some, uh, quite a few people here were involved in a thing called Desperate Monologues, worked with Damien Gorman, who's a playwright, in January and put the first of February. We, we do everything at super <laughs> speed, and, uh, despite saying we're trauma-informed, but <laughs> over a month or so we did a, we put together a thing called Desperate Monologues and performed it in Youth Action's Rainbow Factory uh, on the first of February. And there did the, the, the poster designed by the group, and, and there did the beautiful poster with the playbook drawings and Deirdre has written a poem which she's now going to going to share with you. So. Okay, so I'm just going to introduce myself first. Um, my name is Deirdre and I am an activist with PPR and um, take part in the new script for mental health. I am a survivor of domestic violence and I got involved with PPR to advocate for change to share my real lived experiences in a bid to raise awareness and to help others. Recently, I have found out that women are not even protected in courts. I'm one of them, um, family court in particular, and they are used as basically a platform to further abuse, it's basically for perpetrators to further abuse their victims. Um, I've discovered that there are no mental health support systems in place at all in the courts to aid victims of domestic violence. I'm in court presently at the minute facing my abuser each and every time I go there. Every type of abuse a man could possibly do to a woman, I'm reliving that every single time I'm in court, and I'm just expected to deal. And recently, through no fault of my own, I have been forced to represent myself in court, no solicitor, no barrister, and I really couldn't do it if I did not have the help and support through um, the programs that I've been involved in with the new script for mental health. And basically, my, um, introduction to the new script would be that it just provides a new way. It highlights that the investment in the creative arts can actually help the healing process. I have used dance, as you can see here, calligraphy, art, poetry as a medium to share my story. 
and really it's using these mediums which is a far cry from the doctors wanting to pill push and push medicines onto me. So that's basically a background to me. I wrote this poem because I wanted to try to make my negative experiences into something positive and the only way I can think of doing that is to express this in poetry but also that nothing can ever be in vain and that's what the title is, Nothing is Ever in Vain. My world was falling apart and I would dart around the place to find some healing grace. I'd go here and there looking for help and get nowhere. I was desperate and in despair. I'd see black holes in life and the deeper they got the more I was in strife. There's no one to talk to, there's nowhere to go. The list and services are endless, it's all a bit of a mess. I'm in agony, I'm in pain. But my torture, my experiences, my trauma cannot be in vain. I try to get help, I try to reach out. It's closed doors what my life is all about. I want to talk about my problems, to express my fears, so that I can be there to catch other people's tears. And I hope that things will turn around so people do not feel eternally bound to their past, traumas and hurt and pain. I'm telling you now, nothing is ever in vain. There is a window. There is a way. I'm worthy and I'm not made of clay. You cannot mold me into something that you want me to be because I am unique and different and that's just Thank you. Thank you. Powerful. Don't need to say anything. Thank you. And Deirdre has actually done some drawings for my presentation as well. So I actually just need to make myself some space so I don't ruin Gavin's computer here and get charged for that. I don't usually actually keep notes with me, but what I'm doing today, I am actually reading from some of my reports and things. So um, I, I do actually need my, my notes, which is a bit odd for me because I don't usually talk with, with these, um, but bear with me um, with that. So I guess just, you know, why am I doing this? Um, I've got this little, uh, this little pendant that I keep in my, I've got this little thing that I keep in my bag with some special things in it. Um, and this is a little pendant that um, a fellow inpatient gave me, uh, I can't remember when. Um, but I do remember that I was sitting in the corridor of the inpatient unit. I was very quiet when I wasn't causing mayhem. In between, I was very quiet. Um, and. I just have this, yeah, see some smiling there. Um, I was sitting in the corridor in my dressing gown and I very often was bandaged up and um, this patient who I knew very well, you get to know the ones, you know, us repeat offenders, um, revolving door. And um, he just bent down to me. I was very distressed and he gave me this, this pendant, which was his mother's. Um, and he's still in the system, in and out, and his kids are still not with him. Um, so I keep this to remind me when I'm maybe afraid doing this kind of stuff or think, is it enough or is it right? Um, that that's actually what this is about. Um, and this for me is about meaning making. It's not about blame um, because in the most, and I need to say this, in the most staff were really kind and good to me and they cared. Um, so so th this is not about blame, but it, but it is about speaking the truth of what happened because I've spent a lifetime um, not actually knowing who I was or understanding myself with many mental illnesses. Um, so this needs spoken um, for myself um, and the, the, there's a sense of responsibility around that. So I'm just breaking this into three parts, drowning in disorders, cold concrete cell and holding hope lightly. 
So this man, Don Tate, you can look him up. Um, I was in a treatment center in 2017, and uh, this man, I think, saved my life. Um, and I just want to read here. Uh, I was asked to write a piece for his uh, memorial. Um, he died in 2019, but he'd become a great friend and mentor. And he used to run a group in the treatment center every morning, just a group talking about shame, forgiveness, those kind of things. And he was fierce. Um, and I want, to, I want to read what I wrote about him. So sorry I can't be there with everyone to honor and celebrate Don's life. In treatment, I was a little scared of his fierceness, but his message, delivered in love, saved my life. He became a close friend and mentor over the last few years, and I miss him terribly. What he taught me permeates every aspect of my life. When I doubted myself or fear crept in, he always said, just speak your truth. Mr. Tate, I will continue the work you unlocked in me. I will share my experience with the courage and compassion that comes from gratitude and acceptance. I will honor the gift you gave me of a new pair of glasses through which to see the world. Thank you, brave warrior, for helping me find freedom. Rest in peace, knowing the multitude of seeds you planted will breathe life to many. He was a man who had no judgments. He'd done some dreadful things in his life. <laughs> and he used to put the vodka, and he wouldn't mind me telling you this, in his um, windscreen wiper thing to drink. He used to defend the biker gangs and things in Canada. He was a notorious lawyer. But, but he helped me find life again. And I'm just going to start by reading um, this poem I wrote, and it's called Blinded. What did you see when you looked at me? Bandaged, broken, breaking down, symptoms smothering, suffocating sound. Risk assessed year on year, those boxes ticked. The plans you made the same each time, which I then went and disobeyed. Repeat offender, that was me. Revolving door we all could see, or not. Textbooks teach many truths, they have their place. But I am me and you are you, did you not see? A hundred stories carved upon my skin, speak a truth I needed heard. But I'd been labeled to be understood and a heavy cost was incurred. Not all is as it seems, you know, for you nor me. Behind the walls and masks we wear, we're all just human. We all know despair. So before you judge or label me, please make some space and truly see. Drowning in. <laughs> Drowning in disorders. This is me. Schizoaffective disorder, schizotypal personality disorder, bipolar disorder, major depression with psychotic features, anxiety disorder, borderline personality disorder, that was 2011, I was 37 by the time I got that, anorexia, bulimia, and in 2020, although I no longer believe I'm disordered, I finally got the diagnosis of complex post-traumatic stress and dissociative disorder. What is so wrong with you? 1993 in an old asylum. 2011, requiring microsurgery for lacerating my vein. 
2017. Two antipsychotics, four tranquilizers, sleeping tablets, and an antidepressant. Two thousand and eleven. My kids visiting me in the inpatient unit. I've asked permission to share their photographs and their story as well. We've spoken about this. And my husband's here this morning. And what he went through as well, apart from the wider family, just the fear and the and this is a awful photo. I was on a day pass. Um, you can see I've got my <laughs> hospital band on. That was my daughter and I at the Loch Ness Discovery Center. And this was when I was in ICU and it's a note my mom wrote when I was on life support and she was in South Africa. Gary and I were separated at that time. Matthew George. <laughs> Gary sent me that voice note when I was in hospital. Many years of eight years I missed out on my kids. I wasn't there. So what is electroconvulsive therapy? It involves passing an electric current through the brain large enough to induce a seizure. There is no generally accepted theory for how it works. We don't actually know how it works. And approximately 70% of people who get ECT are women. Because they say women are more depressed. It's International Women's Day tomorrow. And I launched my business three years ago on International Women's Day. Um, yeah, so it's a very significant time, actually, um, tomorrow. And um, today really is about that medicalization of violence against women and the silencing of that. So why is it used? Well, mine states on its website, repeated ECT is only recommended if you've previously responded well to it or if all other options have been considered. The Royal College of Psychiatrists states ECT is a treatment for some types of severe mental illness that have not responded to other treatments. It is usually considered when other treatment options such as psychotherapy or medication have not been successful or when someone is very unwell and needs urgent treatment. It is of concern to me that the people who can do this on their site have a disclaimer which means, says we make no representations, warranties or guarantees whether expressed or implied that the content in this leaflet is accurate, complete or up to date. <laughs> I don't think that that's okay. And I'm not sure if that would happen with a cancer drug or other kinds of treatment. So this is, this is the bits that I'm just going to read through. These are from my direct notes, okay? So this is not my, this is what people have written about me. Just to give you some idea of the me standing here, of the me along the way, those, those many diagnoses. So 1988, the psychiatrist report, 14 years old, she definitely has significant cognitive and somatic features of a major depression. She is also experiencing feelings of worthlessness and feelings that life is meaningless and empty. She has felt life not to be worth living and has even had suicidal ideas. Lisa has significant anhedonia, which means I couldn't take pleasure from anything. 14. 
2012, the psychiatrist reports, she had thoughts of self-harm and did not feel hospital would be beneficial again. I was first admitted in, um, I think, July or August of 2009. My, I'd relapsed with my eating disorder. 2012, husband feels she's high risk to self. He would prefer that she was incarcerated rather than kill herself. Inpatient notes, Gary reports Lisa tried to jump out of car on way to hospital. Well known to psychiatric services with multiple admissions. Tries to abscond. Lisa reports she is full of badness in her whole body and needs to get it out of her. Reassured. Talked about her kids and how guilty she feels. Is anxious about them going away as they've never been away without her. 2013 notes from various psychiatrists. Attending self-harm group has found this quite stressful and of limited benefit. No evidence of depressive symptoms. She has been having flashbacks of her past. She hears a baby crying and believes a man is following her. She does seem to have some psychotic features on the background of depression and EUPD. She reports she is hearing voices which appear to be pseudo-hallucinations. Brief psychotic episodes. Feels that things are happening in her house. Somebody sent a spirit to a man. He kept her in check. No one else has seen him. Severe EUPD, psychosis, pseudo-hallucinations, deterioration in mood, had three courses of ECT to date. This lady has a long history of deliberate self-harm and overdoses. Spectacularly cut her right arm, which required microsurgery. Douched herself with petrol and threatened to set fire to her clothes. EUPD, chronic depression, eating disorder, treatment to date, psychiatrist, CPN, social services with family, eating disorder team. Letter to the occupational health doctor I hadn't worked from 2011. Increased impulsivity and self-harm. Lack of ability to control self-destructive behavior. Increased alcohol consumptions. Lack of any period of stability in the past year. From a point of view of her specific employment as a support worker in the early years service, I'm obliged to point out that there have been significant child protection concerns during this long period of instability and child and family social services are involved with Mrs. Morrison's own children at present. As Gary said, there weren't child protection issues because he was with the children, but social services were involved. Unfortunately, Mrs. Morrison has not been able to make use of her treatments in a way which has significantly modified her self-harming behavior. And I believe that she remains a risk of impulsive and significant deliberate self-harm. Given the long periods of instability and active self-harm, I believe that her prognosis for recovery is limited. 2009, I went into the service. I was in after I had my daughter as well. I'd been unable to make use of treatments in a way that had significantly modified what treatment. 2014 notes. I've got my notes just up to then, some of them, because of my dreadful memory loss, I did ask for them. August 2014, EUPD and question mark around PTSD. It's in my notes that I had suffered significant abuse in my life. In many ways, on different occasions, at different ages. September 2014. Oh, and it says not clinically depressed. 2012, it was not depressed, and then it was depressed. It's not depressed. September 2014, admitted to 1S Craig Avon Area Hospital after discharge from ICU. Felt awful following the meeting with social workers, where I was told she couldn't see her children for do two days following deliberate self-harm made me feel guilty like I was a bad mother. And it's an interesting thing just to comment on that because the thing is actually when we think about listening to people, the safest time for me to be with my children was two days post self-harm 
because what happened and the pattern was that once it healed and the stitches were out, then I would need to harm again. So in fact, if we looked at the pattern, that's the safest time for me to be around. I didn't harm in front of the children. Talked about insects crawling all over her skin, seeing blood on the walls, asked about medications and ECT. Lisa admits to being relieved that she is commencing ECT as it has been beneficial in the past. And I need to say this, nobody forced me to have ECT. You know, I did ask for it. This was the fourth time and I asked for it because getting an anesthetic was like dying. It was that time when you just went under and you were totally removed from your life, which you just didn't want to be living. There are, though, I can only share my experience and my truth and my story. I don't speak for all people. And I know that people, that there would be people who would say that it's helped them. And I know that on the first few occasions, Gary would say that for a very brief period, there did seem to be a, a slight lift in my mood. So I want to be clear about that. I, I see in my notes, I was told and I gave consent. I didn't know my rights around, um, you know, that issue of trying other things first, therapy. I was always deemed too unwell for therapy. Um, and as we know, as John and I have done this research piece and audit on patient information leaflets, and what I know now, I don't believe we could have given informed consent. Gary and I didn't. We thought I'd had two or three sessions. We couldn't actually believe it was six over seven years. Um, as well as when you're in that state, you know, Gary was just worried I was going to die. You'll do anything. You'll do anything. You'll try anything because you're so desperate. Gary is a well-equipped businessman who is not afraid to speak up about things, but he was, and he was afraid that he would be deemed not okay, and then our kids would have nobody. You know, so we really need to be thinking about the whole family and these things and how we're communicating with people. These notes also illustrate that the person you see here you know, not all is as it seems, you know. And the things sometimes that we're dealing with. October 2014, EUPD recurrent depressive disorder. Can't seem to agree on my depression. <laughs> um, and I don't mean that. Nobody was unkind to me, really. Um, but November 2014, Lisa states she is going to try lithium as it is her last hope. Lithium was suggested. Oh, that was just a picture I drew. 2014 to 2017, I don't have my notes, but August 2016, I have a letter that I was referred to clinical psychology. I don't remember what happened about that. Um, April 2017, I went to the treatment center in South Africa. Um, and between 2009 and 2016, 72 EC treatments. Um, so if you're thinking about the guidelines for who gets it and if it's been of benefit before, you know, um, there was talk of supported living, Gary tells me. Gary is my external memory drive. I'm very lucky we got back together, otherwise there would be larger portions of my life I didn't remember. And this is a quote from him. One of the reasons I took thousands of photographs when the kids were young was because I wanted them to remember Lisa, since I knew she wouldn't be alive when they were older. Reflecting on then and now, and I've got this building, I was delivering training, ASW training, um, in that building over there. And I remember it, it was October last year, um, and I'd actually been an inpatient for four weeks prior to that, um, which still happens. And staff are so good working with me and with my safety plan that 
you know, I say, and if this is not a relapse, this is part of the journey, and I'm not ill, this is just, you know, and they've been fabulous. Uh, uh, they really have, and the home treatment team have just learnt about the dissociation and the voices and, the, and have respected and honoured that. And it is really possible, and I'm so grateful for that because I've still needed that support as I heal from a lifetime of, of these things untreated. And I remember walking from the train. I also couldn't take a train until about six months ago because when you've got that trauma held in your body, it's that if I had my car, at least if I needed to escape, I could do that. Whereas if I needed to rely on a train, I couldn't. And I can take a train now. And my daughter, bless her heart, who took me one time before I went to um, treatment and I was so drugged and so anxious going to Belfast with her, it was just a nightmare. You know, and she was sending me a message, say, so proud of you, mum, you know, the first time I went on the train. Um, but I was walking along that avenue, and it was a beautiful sunny day, October time. And I was walking and just looking at it and thinking, like, I almost can't believe that I'm walking along here in this beautiful place, and the sun shines out, and I'm going to this beautiful building to deliver training to social workers, you know, who want to become approved social workers. They're um, responsible for the detention process. And there was just this visual image for me of this and these two things. I could see them so clearly. In, um, I was about 19, I think. I can't remember an awful lot, so exact ages. So don't quote me on any of this and then tell me that you don't believe me. Oh dear, how we respond to people following disclosures of trauma. The damage that is done when we don't believe lasts. So that cold concrete cell is quite literal cold concrete cell. I was in an old asylum in South Africa. I first attempted to take my life at 16 and then again at 19 um, and was on a load of medication. I've been on medication since the age of 14. And I was sent to an old asylum. I was in the open ward and then ended up in the lockup ward um, because of repeated self-harming and attempts to die. And literally for the first, I can't remember how many nights, um, when you went into the ward, they stripped you of your bra and you had these crimpoline dresses that you were put into, you know, like these A-line, I don't know what they're called, but that's, that's what you were put in. You were locked from place to place. And because I was a risk of harm, I, at night time, I was put in a cold concrete cell, stripped, put in a cold concrete cell and left for the night, the door locked. So you literally had, there was a window up there. Um, there was no toilet. And when you went to shower, um, you lined up. All of us women lined up and were stripped and had to shower along with the nursing staff around. And there were straight jackets and there were padded cells. And that was the first time I had ECT as well. So you think about, we sometimes don't know people's experiences when they're coming into a service as well. You know, the, and that was disclosure of, of various traumas. Um, and the problem was in my brain and temporal lobe epilepsy. And they couldn't agree either with what was wrong with me. Um, so there was a bit of an argument about my diagnosis. I think there were four or something like that. Um, and these are the medications that I've been on. This Deirdre, fabulous Deirdre here, drew this for me. Um, Gary helped come up with the, we kind of did a collaborative piece, didn't we? And I'm so appreciative of that because it's like a human being has, somebody with love in their heart has written all of this. Um, that took me away from myself. And a lot of these medications I've been on over that period of time, um, 2009 to, to 2018. Um, Melaril, which I was on, thyridazine, it was taken off the market because of heart conditions. I was on that when I was in the, the lockup ward. But you just look at this. Um, Abilify I was on in 2017, the depot, Risperdal, lithium, sodium valproate. I was on carbamazepine in South Africa, mood stabilizers and antipsychotics, chlorpromazine, haloperidol, diazepam, 
Lyrica, I was on for many years. Um, yeah, it's all there. Quetiapine and the antidepressants. And 96 seizures in my brain. Electric currents went through. It's time for a new script for mental health. And my thought was, as I was walking down there with, I'm so grateful for the life I've got today. And that's why I have that piece, because when I go back in, there's people who were in with me, who are still in. And I know that so many of them have just had, I won't use John's language, but bad things have happened, you know, not the right treatment for them. And then we go into these places and even with our lovely brand spanking new units that we have, it doesn't matter one little bit if you still have no power and no choice and no hope for recovery, which was my experience. I've got in my notes, the team have lost hope in me and I've lost hope in myself. I lost me under all of this. There was no talk of, I had been a competitive swimmer. I had worked. I had played in an orchestra. I'd done a good job with my kids up till then. I ran baby massage classes. I was an aromatherapist. We moved halfway across the world. I came here not knowing anything with no job or anybody, and I made it work. I had no fear of abandonment. Gary was traveling to America and I had two small children and was doing my degree. I couldn't possibly meet the criteria for fear of abandonment. In fact, I don't trust people. I've got my dog. I prefer my dog sometimes to anybody, even my best people here. <laughs> so it's like, just because it's brand spanking new doesn't mean it's not still a cold concrete cell if you lose all sense of self and personhood, if you don't believe that there's a life beyond this, if what's happened to you is not recognized and believed, and you're, well, it was believed in here, but nobody knew what to do with it. I was told, don't talk about that because you're making yourself ill. You need to leave it in the past. We can't leave it in the past. It's in us, it's in our bodies. The research tells us that I don't choose to hear voices and see visions. I don't choose to remember things so painful and so horrific that happened to me. I don't choose that. And other people don't choose that. And that's not saying that I was this wonderful patient who was really easy to get on with. I was... Challenging enough, I absconded and set fire to things and I used to steal the baubles off the Christmas tree and all the impatients hated me for that at Christmas time because I thought I could cut myself with it. I wasn't very popular. And me, this middle-aged woman, dropping my two kids off at their local school, didn't fit the mold too well. So we need to think about trauma-informed environments. What are those? Because so much of this illness that we have happens because of powerlessness and things that happen to us. I'm not saying for everybody that's, that's what it's like, but bad things happen and they do impact us. And yes, it changes our biology, it changes our brain, it changes our nervous system, and we need help to rewire all this self-regulation and personal responsibility. As much as that's important, of course it's important, all those things, but five steps to well-being, let me tell you, if you've been on the level of antipsychotics that some of us in this room have been, don't come telling me with a diet that I've just got to eat healthy and get out and walk when the only person maybe that I saw for five years when Gary and I were separated was my chemist for my daily scripts. You know, this is why we involve people with lived experience. It's easy to involve me because I speak nicely and I've had my anger and my frustration heard, so I'm okay to listen to, but it's a bit more difficult to listen to the people who are still angry and are still... But we tell people to do things and we blame them when they don't do it. And I'm not saying there's not that ownership. 
I was in a cycle of learned helplessness. It wasn't helping me being an inpatient, but I didn't know how to live outside of that because every control was stripped of me. And if you think of what had happened to me, the abuses that were done to me, and then I was on one-to-one -one observations and I couldn't go to the toilet. I had to undress in front of people. I wasn't allowed to run because of my eating disorder. I couldn't self-harm. And you're stuck in a courtyard, which everybody thinks is fabulous because there's a lovely garden, but you feel like a caged animal. You're seeing things and you're hearing things and there's blood running down the wall and you're on your own and nobody wants to talk about that or what's happened to you. And I've heard recently about, you know, the lack of communication with people. You know, I teach about this, polyvagal theory, context, choice, connection, context, the why, the what, and the how. We need that to feel safe. Our nervous system looks for it. We need to feel connected, but we're so busy with self-responsibility. Co-regulation is a biological imperative. For the rest of our lives, we need other people. And yet we're shamed for needing help. And what's happened for me, and I'm so grateful because there's so many of you in this room who have helped me with this journey, and my therapist, is I needed somebody to do it with me, to learn how to regulate over and over and over again. Because I was 47 or something when I went into therapy. I couldn't do it. I couldn't engage with the, I can use the sensory garden now in the inpatient unit because I've had three years of someone doing with me and teaching and helping me regulate my breathing after a lifetime of not knowing how to do that and actually learning to reconnect with the body, which is a painful experience as well. Dissociation is very helpful. And I'm just going to tell you one story. Sorry, coffee's going to be a little bit late. <laughs> 25th of the 3rd, 2014. And this is a photograph from the Roan Sexual Assault Unit. And um, I've had permission from, from Dr. Olive Buckley, who I met with. She was the clinical lead who saw me after I was raped in 2014. And that's a photograph, um, that's a, a photograph of, of the corridor that they have between where you're clinically assessed and then where you meet with and I'm just going to tell you briefly about this, this story. Um, these are from my notes. Lisa arrived to the ward via a taxi alone. Rape allegations two days prior. CPN took Lisa to the Rhone Sexual Assault Unit. PSNI aware and process of investigation begun. PSNI came to visit Lisa today for questioning. Lisa states becoming upset and distressing. ASW was present due to vulnerability to review in the morning with the social worker on the unit. October 2014, I was an inpatient four times that year. Having flashbacks, Lisa spoke of her worries with children, saying she feels she's missing out on their lives. Lisa really misses her two kids and worries they don't miss her. Says she feels hopeless and has broken up her family. Lisa told her alleged, Lisa told her alleged attacker would not be prosecuted as there was not enough evidence. Lisa, very distressed, feels she does not ever get justice. She's getting flashbacks on her attack and advised to contact Nexus. Now, just to say about that, Dr. Buckley, Olive Buckley, I tell this story because it represents so much of re what recovery has been for me. And this was the one thing that my memory remembered a certain thing about this, but I really wanted to know if what I remembered was, was how it was. And um, I contacted the Rhone. I didn't want my notes just sent to me. And um, they said that Dr. Buckley would see me. She'd actually remembered me. And um, Deirdre came with me on my first visit. And um, Bridget, my therapist, came on my second one. And that was a significant moment for me meeting Dr. Buckley, Olive she likes to be called, because she believed me. She was the one who'd said that given the extent of your injuries, prosecution was almost a given. 
but she's commented and I've, I've checked with her and she said I can quote her on that. She says, I agree with the comments about mental health. People with mental health um, are less believed and less likely to progress through the criminal justice system because they're not seen as a credible witness or can't stay engaged with the whole process. The wheels of justice are so slow. And although there's been improvements in recent years, it's still very traumatic, like you were saying, with, with the domestic violence. Um, and she said she can share this, that she's also been through it. And she found it difficult to stick with. She also said that your recovery has given me great encouragement and hope. And do you know what Olive said to me is she said, I remember you. And she said, I remember seeing you underneath all those drugs you were on and thinking there was somebody in there and I hoped that you would recover. And you know, over that period of time, I don't, didn't feel like anybody saw the me underneath. And there's something deeply, deeply healing for me to have known that she thought that at that time. And I think we underestimate sometimes even conversations that I've had with staff when I was an inpatient, you know, just things we've talked about can be so, so helpful. And I want to tell you what happened after this. Um, and even going via taxi alone, I didn't feel I could ask, call any of my friends or ask anybody to take me in. That was my level of not being an anybody. So this goes on to the ECT because that year after that rape was the fourth time I got ECT. Has had two ECT, mood brighter, fleeting thoughts of setting herself on fire. No subjective anterograde or retrograde amnesia. Then we go on ECT number nine, 195.8, whatever those things are, John. Situational stresses are perhaps clouding the effect of ECT. That year I was going through a divorce. The divorce never came through because I was too unwell. Thankfully, because we're back together. <laughs> Here we sit, the two apart. I don't know what we are, my darling. But um, yeah, I was going through a divorce. I'd been raped after a significant history of other traumas. Um, I had no work. I'd moved out of the family home. Um, I don't think I've got a history of poor coping skills, as I keep saying in my notes. I just developed coping skills that I could at the time, which was very creative. Anyway, I can't go through all of this because I've talked far too long. Um, and I need to finish with the, the little bit of hopeful bit. But basically, it's going through and it's noting that I'm saying it's not really helping. Um, still going to go and do lithium and just near the end of the course an episode of deliberate self-harm yesterday after seeing the children completed ECT so at the end of the ECT course it helped that much that I was still self-harming CGI score much improved but do you see in my notes with the other psychiatrist that they're really that's a little bit debatable and then in terms of progress in my follow-up eight weeks later it says she states that currently she is in a very dark place. She reports no improvement with her recent hospitalization or ECT treatment. So I still had two more courses after that. So just in terms of monitoring and regulation and audit and all of these things, why are we doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results? It's not all about the money either. So I've just got some facts up there about that one year, that 2014, without medications, the emergency department, 27 times in one year I visited, ED visits, ICU, any of that, that would have cost, just for a bed, £72,450 for one year, and I spent eight years doing this. So when we say there's not enough money for specialist trauma therapy, for creative solutions, for art space, for community building, it's where we're putting the resources. We're just doing more of the same and just like recalibrating or reordering it rather than saying we need to really think about what's working or not. I do believe that shocking my brain because of deep distress caused by things that have happened to me is a violence I should not have had to endure. I do believe that because it has robbed me of this year 
This year, I spent a year, I took out of work childminding my son, my precious two and a half year old son with my friend's baby. And I don't remember that year. I don't remember him at that. I don't remember making him his bishy cake. That's his little thing that he loved. I don't remember it. I don't remember my wedding and I don't remember my graduation. And year on year, my little external memory drive there, I'm remembering more of what I don't remember, significant things in my life. So even though nothing was forced on me, it is a violence I shouldn't have had to endure after what I've been through. Holding hope lightly. I talk about that holding hope lightly because sometimes I lose hope still. It's a long journey out of this and you're just living in the world today. I think we all can and I know how precious services are and how little time people have. And my uncle and I talked about this web and at one point that web was actually a cage with those diagnoses and drugs and labels because we treat a symptom because the cultures and so many of the services will blame staff. I recognize that they'll be blamed if they allow, you know, so they don't have options and choice. They're spending so much, keep hearing so much time on paperwork. We can't be with people. You know, so these are structural issues that impact everybody, not just those of us needing services. We're clipping the wings of people who want him to do things differently. The web that weaves now, I see that web as a very, um, a very fluid web. I need these structures and things in place, this community, this connection. My people, my people here, so many of you here today, Gary, Deirdre, Anne, Sarah, all of you, you know, Gavin, Gavin, you've been so good to me, you know, it's amazing the power differentials that you think you're so less than when you're in services, I can still feel that. And you've got people here who just take me as me. My dog, Dexter, my daughter turned 21 and I was there for that. I turned 50 and all those photographs that we've got. Christmas day, just the four of us and the kids are so good. Peer trainer role at the recovery college with you and you know that opened a door for me to be able to start to work again. Nobody else would have employed me. Allowed to go and do the things and learn about the system that I had been in on the other side of the door and I'm so grateful for that. Such an important part of my journey. Five months in the 12 step rehab with Don. Detox of all medications. Two years of withdrawals, brain zaps, sweats. Oh my goodness, coming off all those meds after being on 30 years, it wasn't really the right way to withdraw, Mr. Reed. But at least they knew that I needed to clear my brain. I did choose a few years ago to go back on low dose of some, but I went on that knowing that what I was taking and what it was doing for me, and it dampens down things because sometimes it can all be a bit overwhelming. So it's about informed choice. People have rights. We're not stupid just because we're distressed. I'm not just suddenly smart because I'm dressed well and I've got my makeup on. That was, that's all me there. People have rights and there are serious human rights violations currently going on in our mental health services around the detention process. People saying people are being illegally detained, being used to exclude people. People being silenced. And then we talk about social issues. People with social issues need to go to community and voluntary sector who are on their knees. And people with mental illness can use the mental health services. But we know that social issues, poverty, inequality, violence against women and girls, et cetera, et cetera, so often cause mental illness. So how are we even separating that out again? EMDR therapy. She's a psychiatrist as well, can I just say? Okay, I don't really, I've had some lovely psychiatrists these last few years. This isn't about that, but it's just about a way of thinking about things. Reconnecting with nature, strengths, yoga, activism, new script has been so much part of this, and I'm finishing with this here. It is time for a new script for mental health. We need to start destigmatizing and having a different conversation about this stuff. 
because whilst we keep locating blame within individuals, we need diagnoses to access things. I'm not saying New Script is about choice. It's about come together and have the conversation. Let's talk about this stuff. It's about choices and options, the basics of trauma-informed care. But there aren't alternatives. You have no other way to make meaning of your experiences other than an illness. So that's what Sarah's told you, so I'm not going to say any more about that, but I'm going to finish just with a poem. And you know, this poem, um, the, the woman from Pills, the Public Interest Litigation Service, asked me to read this at the end of one of their, their three-day thing. And they printed my poem on this beautiful, in this beautiful way. You have no idea how much these things mean. Because this isn't just a poem, this is me. And people taking care with those small things is so, so important. And I'm reading this poem for all those parts of me that were judged and labeled and seen as difficult and held down and silenced and that I abandoned. And it's called, Then She Came. This is for Eve. Trauma visited in different dress. I had no choice, no voice, no redress. You don't know if you don't know. Body battered, bruised, betrayed. Head fucked up, confused. Trapped and tried, whilst all around closed their eyes. I'll never be untouched again. And then again, and then again, and then again. Shame too big to have a name, an all-consuming flame, piercing, slicing, penetrating, persistent pain. And then she came. Thank God she came. Soft and sure a choice. Quiet soothing, consuming, subtly cruel voice. Like head in water, body held, rocked in rhythm with the swell. Pain and shame, she would dispel. It felt like freedom, freedom from hell. You just didn't understand and labeled, packaged, risk assessed. Locked up, locked in, just a thing. Pills, poor brain, zap, shut up, shut down, shut out. You don't belong. Don't talk, it'll make you ill. Raped, consumed, discarded in the garbage bin. And then she came again and again and again. I know her well, her name. So many tears fell unseen, not heard. No hands to hold or arms and fold or shh. I'm here. One minute all can be okay and then we fall, regress and, and it overwhelms, fills my chest, no breath escape, no place. The world feels far away me misplaced all the theories brains and clout better than exclusive clang she promised peace release i know now why she came so i just finish with this why does this matter so much that's why it matters so much. I don't think I need to say anything about that. That was Hannah and I in the Drakensberg Mountains in South Africa in April last year. And I'm so, so grateful for all the people who've walked alongside and continue to walk alongside on this long journey for this community of the new script that I feel so part of and belonging to for the first time in my life the people who love me with all the, for Bridget, 
this should be possible for everybody. Should be possible for everybody. So thank you for listening. That's a hard act to follow, isn't it? And uh, it made me think I'm giving entirely the, the wrong lecture. I should be talking about another area of my research, which is how rarely mental health services ask people about child abuse and neglect and rape and violence. And how when people do manage to disclose to mental health services, how rarely they get anything useful. Um, so I should be giving that lecture, actually, but I won't. I'll, I'll stick to what I'm supposed to be talking about. But it did also remind me of, um, on that topic of how mental health services tend not to ask about what's going on in people's lives. About probably 12 years ago now, I was brought over from New Zealand where I was working to train uh, 100 psychiatrists in how to ask about trauma. And I asked Jackie Dillon, who's sort of an English equivalent of, of Lisa, and you can both take that as a compliment, um, to do it with me. She'd been seriously but through similar things to, to Lisa. And I bored them all to death for all morning with all the statistics about child abuse and its relationship to psychosis and depression and so forth, and how rarely people are asking. And then in the afternoon, Jackie told her story about what she'd been through, and I sat behind as the, and watched the tears well up. And I know which part of the, that day the psychiatrist would have remembered. So here's the bit you're not going to remember today. <laughs> but it is important, I think, for or people with Lisa's experience and, and my whatever it is, knowledge or expertise to work together so that people like Lisa cannot be dismissed as, oh, that's very interesting and inspiring, but very rare. How, un how, un how unusual, what an unusual person Lisa is. And in many ways, I think we'd all agree she is, but what she went through is not unusual. Um, and so when people talk about ECT wiping out parts of their lives, um, some psychiatrists will say, yes, that, that does happen, but very, very rarely. So I want to challenge some of that. So here's our agenda, um, very briefly on the, the context within which um, the idea that putting electricity through somebody's brain to cause a convulsion could possibly be thought to be a good idea. You've got to have a quite a strong and unusual context for that to be thought of as a good idea. A little bit of the history, and then I will bore you to death with what the research says about whether it is effective and um, what the adverse effects are. And then we will touch on a bit of work that Lisa and I have done together about what people are being told um, here in Northern Ireland, but also around the, the rest of the United Kingdom, uh, people who are about to have ECT. So just uh, this is a, a way to, in, in one quote, to summarize what's wrong with the medical model. This is the American Psychiatric Association explaining to us why some of us get depressed sometimes. Major depressive disorder is a medical illness, not could be or might be or one way to think about it is, it is a medical illness and it affects how you feel, think and behave causing persistent feelings of sadness and loss of interest in previously enjoyed activities. So it's an illness and it's a thing that causes you to have all these feelings and thoughts which is actually backwards circular logic. It's like saying depression is caused by depression. Not depression is caused by all the things going on in my life that are depressing, but it's because I've got this thing inside of me that we, nobody can see it or measure it or anything, but it's this thing we tell you, you've got inside of you, that's causing you to be depressed. It can lead, it's, it's, it's a word, but it becomes a causal explanation. It can lead to a variety of emotional and physical problems. And it is a chronic illness, so once you are depressed and have got this thing causing you to be depressed, you will always be like that. And then they wonder why people don't get better. You will always be like that. Um, and it usually requires long-term treatment, and we know what they mean by that. And that's, that's what leads to one in four people, in, uh, one in four women in Northern Ireland being on antidepressants at the moment. That's, that's the context, that's the model. We have turned understandable emotions 
like sadness and grief and loss into a, into a disorder and pretended that it explains things. I've written a lot about that in a book with Jackie Dillon actually and I think 13 psychiatrists are in there. I mention that because I'm sometimes accused of being anti-psychiatry, it's the diagnostic label that's used for, for me, I'm, I'm, I've got anti-psychiatry disorder apparently, which is a good way to dismiss all the evidence but um, anyway. Um, and it's important to just contextualise this also, this focus on the medical model with what um, the World Health Organization and the United Nations has to say about it. The predominant focus of care in many contexts continues to be on diagnosis, medication, symptom reduction. Critical social determin determinants that imp impact on people's mental health, such as violence, discrimination, poverty, job insecurity, unemployment, lack of access to housing, social safety nets, health services, are often overlooked or excluded from mental health concepts and practice. This leads to an overdiagnosis of human distress, over-reliance on psychotropic drugs to the detriment of psychosocial intervention. This is not some radical anti-psychiatry patient movement. This isn't new script even. This is the World Health Organization. Similarly, the United Nations, you had a picture of Danius up uh, earlier, I think, Sarah, uh, who was a psychiatrist, um, who was the United Nations Human Rights Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health. He writes, current mental health policies have been affected to a large extent by the asymmetry of power and biases because of the dominance of the biomedical model and biomedical interventions. This model has led not only to the overuse of coercion in case of psychosocial, intellectual and cognitive disabilities, but also the medicalization of normal reactions to life's many pressures including moderate forms of social anxiety, sadness, shyness, truancy, and antisocial behavior. This is the context within which some people, only a small number of people, a dwindling number of people, still think, and with good intention, these are good people, still think it's a good idea to put electricity through the human brain with express intention of causing grand mal seizures. That's the, the context. The other context, of course, is historical. We've always done weird things to people we decide are weird. Weird disorder. Not fitting in disorder, in Lisa's case. Or we've hung them up from the ceiling. I don't know what this one was about, how that was supposed to make you sane. This is the rotating chair that spun you into unconsciousness, which somehow was supposed to make you sane. Um, the original shock therapy, by the way, was in the 17th century, where they used to stand people with melancholia next to cannons and at some point it was supposed to be a surprise they were sneaked up behind them and lit the cannon as if they didn't know that was coming um, it was surprise cannon therapy and boom and that was supposed to shock them back into again well intentioned but silly I had I ventured to suggest this is a bit too awful to look at I'm really sorry but this is not so long ago um, 1930s, invented at the same time as electroshock therapy, electroconvulsive therapy. Um, we'll perhaps move on, except to say as that evolved, that was the early version of it, literally just putting a, a metal rod into the brain and wiggling it about. A later version, which was meant to be kinder, was to place radioactivity, radioactive material inside the brain, so that the lesions occurred more slowly and people could adjust to it better than having it all done in one go. So we have a history of doing odd things to people and I have no doubt that in 10 to 15 years time somebody will be stood here saying and here's another thing that we used to do to people but now we realize that was a bit silly. Um, what were the rationales when it was introduced in the 1930s? There were two major rationales. The first was the idea that um, there was a lot of mutual exclusive, mutually exclusive theories around in medicine at the time. If you didn't have A, you couldn't have, if you had A, you couldn't have B. And there was a theory, no basis to it at all, that if you had epilepsy, you couldn't have schizophrenia. And ECT was first used for schizophrenia. Used more for depression now, still a bit for schizophrenia. Um, so they were, at that point, they were treating people with epilepsy by injecting with the blood of people with schizophrenia to try and cure the epilepsy. This is how primitive it is. And you can read this in the medical journals. And the cure for schizophrenia was to cause epilepsy. 
to cause grand mal seizures. And they tried all sorts of different ways to do that. They had insulin shock, um, which drove you into a, a convulsion. And they eventually ended up in electricity. Long story how they got there. So that was one theory. The other theory, um, because today, of course, the psychiatrists who use it understandably say it couldn't possibly cause brain damage. How dare you say it causes brain damage? That's going to scare patients. You've got to stop saying that, John. The people who introduced it um, were very clear that it causes brain damage, and that's how it works. Article, Walter Freeman, called Brain Damaging Therapeutics, 1941. The greater the damage, the more likely the remission of psychotic symptoms. Maybe it will be shown that a mentally ill patient can think more clearly and more constructively with less brain in actual operation. Yeah, it's, it's funny. It's a laugh or cry, isn't it? I mean, it is funny, but it's also very, very sad. Another, uh, it wasn't just Walter Freeman. This was uh, all, there have to be organic changes or organic disturbances in the physiology of the brain for the cure to take place. I think the disturbance in memory is probably an integral part of the recovery process. I think that it may be true that these people have, at the time being at any rate, more intelligence than they can handle, and that the reduction in intelligence is an important factor in the curative process. And some went as far as to say that another way it worked, this brain damage and the memory loss, it was good because it was wiping out traumatic memories. So this is a very bad joke. That's a trauma-informed theory of what's wrong with mental, or what causes mental health problems. Uh, but the answer is to wipe, wipe out the memories. Interesting. And this isn't talked about today, of course, because it's unethical to, to, to have a medical procedure that causes brain damage. So you can't acknowledge that. But that's when it was introduced, how it was thought to work. And for the first eight or nine years, um, it was seen to work. People were being discharged from hospital. People who had been in hospital for decades with no hope of, of cure, given ECT, and were being discharged. And, it, and so it must have been working except that the people who were making the decisions about discharge were the same people giving the ECT. So they, there was a very strong expectation built up. Um, and there is a temp we'll see, there is a temporary short-term gain for, for some, some people. But there were no studies done. But fair enough, back then, it wasn't, we weren't evidence-based then. I'm not entirely sure we are evidence-based today, but we claim to be evidence-based. We'll, we'll look at that in a minute. But there were no studies for the first 11 years, not until 19... Um, 1950 did they do a study, and the first uh, ECT was in 1938. That study found lower recovery rates for people who had been given ECT than those who were not. And the second one found no difference. Made no, didn't matter, just carried on the same. In fact, they weren't really very good studies because you couldn't do proper placebo studies. A placebo study with ECT is when you um, you give one group of people the, the general anaesthetic and the ECT, and another group of people the general anaesthetic, but you withhold the ECT. Um, and you can, we'll see what happens in a minute when you do that. But at that point, they couldn't because everybody would know who had the ECT because the, um, the number of people with broken bones and so forth at that point was before they were using general anaesthetic. It was introduced after about about 10 years, because there were spinal fractures and so on. So to bring us up, up, up to date in terms of what the research says today, um, we, I've done published several summaries of the research in peer-reviewed journals. This is the most recent one. This was with um, Irving Kirsch, who is the um, Associate Director of Placebo Studies at Harvard Medical School, who's hard to dismiss as a sort of radical um, anti-psychiatry person. Um, Harvard Medical School, probably the world's leading expert on placebo studies in, in, in mental health. Um, and we managed to get a lot of uh, media attention around this because of the, the conclusions we reached were fairly, I guess the people who didn't know the research were fairly surprising. Let's just look at, um, for a minute, um, at this slide, which shows that there has only ever been 11 studies in the whole history of this treatment, only ever been 11 studies comparing ECT with sham ECT, ECT with um, placebo. When you look at antidepressants, there will be 500, 1,000, antipsychotics, 1,000. 
11, and none since 1985. None for nearly 40 years. In 85 and, and before, there were these 11, 11 studies. Tiny, look at the numbers, tiny studies. They were all very poorly designed by modern standards, but this is all we've got to go on. Six of them found no difference between the ECT and the sham ECT. So giving someone the general anesthetic without the ECT was just as effective as giving them the ECT as well. Um, three found um, there was a, a temporary difference, no long term, we'll come on to that. And two found these mixed results. It's particularly interesting, the one in the middle there, Johnston et al., which is a very famous study, where the psychiatrists saw a difference, but the nurses and the patients did not see a difference. I'm not saying who was right, I'm just saying, isn't that interesting? And then is the one we're not sure what to make of Brandon et al. down here, where they did, well, often the patients weren't included in, 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 you know, do you think you've got better? Um, the psychiatrist said yes, and they did ask the patients, but they decided not to publish the results. So we don't know what the patients thought. You can't do that in science. You can't, you can't pick which bits you publish depending on whether you like it or not. Um, but this is, this is measures taken within the first week after the series of ECT. The average number of ECTs in a series is, is eight. It should have been six to 12, between six and 12. So after the last one, that's, that's when these studies were. Um, is there any benefit beyond that? Only ever been three studies. You couldn't name a medical treatment that's only ever had three studies to see if it has any benefits mm -hmm. compared to placebo. Again, the, the, la the latest one here was 1980. So two of them, um, uh, one found that ECT was a little better than placebo one month later, one found that placebo was better than ECT a month later, and one found no difference. Is that the basis for using a, a treatment on about a million people a year still? And the only one that's ever looked beyond, month, uh, beyond one month was six months, no difference between ECT and placebo. This perhaps wouldn't matter if there weren't any side effects, you know, we'll come on to the side effects. And I also should just stress for a minute um, that placebo is not a bad thing. So if you've got a treatment and there's a no difference between the treatment and placebo, it doesn't mean it isn't working for some people. It means that for those people for whom it's working, it's the placebo that's doing the lifting, doing the, doing the work. Um, and there's very strong placebo effects with a very intrusive treatment like ECT. Um, so uh, you have a lot of extra attention to what you normally get. You've got lots of nurses, you've got anesthetists, there's eight of them, general anesthetic. So, I mean, nobody does a general anesthetic without an, an operation or procedure without knowing that it wor works and it's going to help you. So you feel like something's happening and uh, something has been done to help you. And you wake up also with quite a, uh, any minimal brain trauma causes quite a, a buzz in the brain. We we'll call it, that's not a very scientific term, it's called mild euphoria. But, um, so you do feel a bit different when you come around. So, um, so it is possible for some people to feel better, um, but it's not because it, any, anything uh, has changed, no, the chemical, no chemical imbalance has been improved or anything like that. It, it's because of the whole pr procedure. A lot of what us psychologists do is placebo. It's about creating hope and expectation. Nothing, nothing wrong with it. Just have to have that. So that's my indirect way of saying this does help some people temporarily. Not because, usually because of the electricity or the convulsion, but because of the whole procedure of being helped and somebody taking the trouble to arrange all this for you. The conclusions of our big analysis was that the quality of most sects, sham ECT versus ECT studies, is so poor, it isn't actually possible to conclude anything about efficacy. So I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm saying we don't know. After nearly 90 years, we don't know whether it works better than placebo or not. And I think we ought to. The argument given and when we challenge uh, ECT psychiatrists about this, they say, well, it would be unethical to do the sort of study that you think we should be doing, John. 
because it would be unethical to withhold a treatment that we know works from people who really need the treatment. Which well, sounds fair enough until you think a bit about that. That positions them entirely outside the process of science. The whole point of doing um, placebo-controlled studies is to counteract the tendency that we all have to believe that whatever I'm doing works. So it's like saying, well, I know all the therapy I used to do work. I don't, I don't need to evaluate it or compare it to anything else. That would be wrong to deprive people of me, this wonderful therapist, because I know I work. You can't do that. I'm going to be offended if you do that. But they say you can't do that study, that sort of study, because it's depriving people of a, of a treatment that we know works. Um, we also concluded there's no evidence that ev evidence ECT is effective for its particular target demographics, which is older women or its target diagnostic group, severely depressed people, or for suicidal people. And then we um, took the position that given the high risk of permanent memory loss, which I'll come on to, and the small mortality risk, this long-standing failure to determine whether or not ECT works means that its use should be immediately suspended until a series of well-designed, randomized, placebo-controlled studies have investigated whether there really are any significant benefits against which the proven significant risks can be weighed. Which is close to saying it should be banned because the outcome of doing that would be that it would be banned. But as a scientist, I think it's a better position to take that, that we don't know, do the studies. If we're wrong and all the people who say it's damaged them and it didn't help them are wrong, and you can show that it's better than placebo, we will have to back off and. Um, except that we were wrong. Um, it is used for uh, schizophrenia. Interestingly, outside of Europe and America, it's used more for schizophrenia than for depression, which was its original um, target. And, and they have done some uh, sham ECT, placebo ECT studies um, since 1985, three of them. Um, none of them found any difference at the end of treatment and the one that did a 20-week follow-up, no, no difference. So that's, that's what happens when you do do sham versus um, placebo ECT versus ECT. But they won't do it for depression. They refuse to do it. Then there's this whole issue of um, patients are, are, and relatives are often told, well, it's, it's going to save somebody's life. I don't know if they, they told, told you or Gary that, but lots of people get told that. And again, there isn't any evidence for that. It's a wish or it's a hope. Um, but there's no evidence for it. So the UK government did a big, big analysis back in 2003. That there is no direct evidence ECT prevents suicide. New Zealand government, these are presumably sort of fairly independent bodies. They're not on one side or other of the argument. They found no definitive randomised evidence that ECT prevents suicide. More recently, last year, this huge study of nearly 12,000 Danish ECT patients, they were found to be 44 times more likely than match controls to have killed themselves over the following two years. 44 times more likely. And yet, patients are told, this can save your life. I suppose it's possible that you might be the one in 100 that it, that it does. And I know people who tell me, John, why did you go on about ECT? It did save my life. And my position on that is if somebody believes that it saved their life, then it did. You, yeah? The fact that they believed they were better, felt better, and it saved their life, because that's wonderful. But it's very rare. It does happen. You've got to weigh all of that, that lack of evidence of efficacy, against the downside. And do you need research to know that putting 150 volts of electricity through brain cells that are equipped to deal with tiny fractions of one volt. That's how our brains operate in terms of uh, our various neurotransmitter systems and so forth, brain cells communicating with one another. Tiny fractions of one volt, 150 volt. Not all of the 150 volts gets through, so it's some proportion of the 150 volt. But what gets through is between 10 and 100 times stronger than what the brain cells are designed to deal with. 
Um, it wasn't until 2007 that somebody did a proper study when you take people at the point of ECT and then follow them for six months. There was a lot of retroactive studies sort of looking back, which aren't very good sorts of studies, sometimes the best we had. And they were the best we had until 2007, when Harold Sackheim and his team, a very pro ECT psychiatrist, who I think generally thought, I'm going to put this to bed forever. This is going to show there is no memory loss after six months, because patients are told there's a little bit of memory loss and it comes back. And that's true for some people. What we didn't know is how many it isn't true for. He thought he was going to just show that it's very, very rare indeed. Um, he found that there was more memory loss than for the control group at six months, by which time it's unlikely to come back. It might, you might get a little bit coming back. Certainly if you've got memory loss at one week, you can be fairly hopeful that some of that will, will come back. But by six months, probably not. Um, impressively, the number of ECTs people had had, remember I said a series is between, usually between six and 12, could be two, could be 10, but the number they'd had correlated with the amount of memory loss. That's a pretty powerful finding. 12% had what he decided to call marked and persistent memory loss, which is a very extreme measure he used. Uh, it gets a bit boring statistically, but it's two standard deviations away from the middle point. It's quite extreme. So 12% had extreme memory loss, and women and older people had particularly high rates of memory loss. What are the two major target groups for ECT? Women and older people. Also, bilateral ECT um, causes more memory loss than unilateral. Now, bilateral is when they place the electrodes on both sides of the head. It, um, and unilateral was developed specifically because bilateral causes a lot of memory loss. That's not why they said they do it. They thought, well, well, let's just do it over here for some, you know. They had to, the problem is to introduce unilateral, they had to admit that the bilateral was causing a lot of memory loss. Would it cause less, less memory loss if they put both on one side? And of course, they put it on the non-dominant, they put it on the side that um, the effects of which are not measured in terms of um, verbal memory and so forth. That's a, that's a detail. Anyway, the bilateral, as it was kind of known, demonstrated, this study demonstrated, bilateral causes a lot more memory loss than unilateral. Um, and in fact, he said at the end, he concluded little justification for the continued use of bilateral ECT because of this. Now, I'm going to show you as, as we go along some extracts from the, uh, the international online survey that Lisa and I and others are currently running. And um, people are, four times as many people are getting bilateral as ECT today around the world. Um, sine wave and brief pulse, brief pulse, no difference. And that's important because a lot of the arguments are that brief, brief pulse is less damaging. That's what we do these days. You'll often hear um, that in the old days, yes, there was a bit of damage. But the way we do it now with the brief pulse and the, and the unilateral is very little damage. And also the memory loss was not related to the level of depression. That's important because another thing people are told is if you do have memory loss after ECT, that's because you're depressed. It's the depression that causes the memory loss, not the ECT. And the evidence is the other way around. That's what happens when you ask patients. There's a number of studies there. How many people had persistent or permanent memory loss six months after ECT? Um, this is what happens when the psychiatrists fill out the form. Um, a, a measure of complete inability to remember. This is just from last year, the Royal College of Psychiatrists in the UK. 1.2% uh, have complete inability to remember. If you ask the relatives, it's 16%. If you ask the patients, it's 24%. These are not small differences. Other adverse effects coming up from our um, online survey. Um, I'll just draw your attention to the one, at, the two at the bottom, relationship problems. Nobody ever asks, does ECT mess up your relationships? Um, does it cause you to not be able to do your job anymore? And this is so far 200. We're going for 1,000, but this is at the point where we had 200. Does it cause brain damage? Um, well, 
some eminent people have said it uh, clearly does, including an ECT machine manufacturer who includes permanent brain damage in its list of risks. But you still have psychiatrists saying it doesn't. But the people who produce the machine say, yes, it does. Um, and we asked people in our survey, do you think you have suffered brain damage? Um, a lot of people aren't sure, which is fair enough. Um, the mental health, uh, the, the World Health Organization of the United Nations clearly think people should be told about the risks, the short and long-term harmful effects, such as memory loss and brain damage. And they went on to say that ECT is not recommended for children and this should be prohibited through legislation. Uh, our surveys at the minute is showing that 8% um, of ECT around the world is, is on people under 18 at the moment, whose brains are still developing. Mortality, I will not uh, dwell on except to say that the, there's this story that has been put out for decades that it's, the rate is 1 per 10,000 patients, just been repeated over and over again in all these different official documents, and the rates are much higher than that, all the actual, actual studies. But still you know, relatively small, it's not the major, it's not the major problem. Um, I've got stuck here now. How do I get out of that? Last viewed, can't get up to there. I don't want to press the wrong thing, else. I'll self-destruct. <laughs> I know that well. <laughs> Thank you. No. Yeah. Cardiac events, this is, um, I, I need to draw to a close, so we've got some time to discuss. So I'll talk briefly about the issue of what people are being told. Um, there is a very important principle which you'll all know about called informed consent. People have to be told about the risks and benefits properly, completely. Um, we published a, a study after uh, Lisa had um, gathered from Freedom of Information requests what are the information leaflets about ECT in Northern Ireland telling people um, as well as um, we did Scotland and Wales. We'd previously done England um, and out of 29 accurate statements that should be included in an information leaflet, um, about 16 in Northern Ireland out of 29 were included, and they had seven inaccurate statements. So Northern Ireland is about the same as everywhere else in the United Kingdom in terms of not giving um, accurate information. I'll just give you some examples of that. So the sorts of things that are often left out the cardiovascular risks, the risk of mortality, the risks from multiple general anaesthetic procedures. Because people are told, this is no more dangerous than having a minor operation, the risks associated with a general anaesthetic. That might be true, but they forget to say, but don't forget you're having 10 of them. They're not told there's no evidence of long-term benefits, and they're very usually not told how to access a legal advocate, which is their, their right. Um, and they are told things like it's the most effective treatment, it saves lives, and it corrects biological causes of depression. These are just, we'll call them untruths, to be polite. Um, our audit in England um, of how ECT is generally being administered, uh, interestingly, a 47-fold difference between the trust that uses it the most and the one that uses it the least. Most people, women and um, over 60, no surprise there. 37% given it against their will without consent. Um, very little data being gathered. Very little, well, very little. 30% using proper depression scales to measure outcomes. 24% using any standardized measure of cognitive dysfunction. And not a single trust in England could provide any data on efficacy or adverse events after the end of treatment. Nobody was bothering to follow these people up at all. Would you want to have ECT again if a psychiatrist thought you needed it in our survey? So far, yes, 21%, no, 73%. I can't think of another medical treatment where the vast majority of people would say, I don't want it again. Maybe, maybe there are some, I'm not sure. Um, and finally, the causes of, the, we're asking people about the causes of the original problem. 75% in our survey so far say that they believe that things that had happened in the previous six months contributed to the reason they were given ECT. 38% saying a lot, a lot of the reason I was upset or depressed was because of what was going on in my life, mostly loneliness and isolation, major loss. 
and 40% had been asked about that in their mental health system. And 22% said that the, the problems that they think had caused the issue for which they were given ECT was addressed in any way by the mental health. Um, and so final slide, I won't read all of it because this is sort of along the lines of what can be done about this. Um, we, Lisa and I are part of the UK ECT Improving Standards campaign group and we've just written to the Labour Party to include, hopefully to include in their manifesto. Um, uh, we've attached our audits of ECT clinics and information leaflets. We've informed them that a class action case is being prepared by a law firm in, in London to take the health trusts and the psychiatrists to court about the lack of informed consent. Um, and that we've got the support of 25 MPs, the Shadow Minister for Mental Health, Mind, etc. So th there are things that can be done. And I'm going to um, repeat the fact to close with, I don't think, I do think this helps some people. Um, I'm not, uh, I, I'm a, what I'm against is people not being told about the pros and cons properly so they have a proper choice. And I also think it's a problem that the people who advocate this, and it is a dwindling number of psychiatrists around the world who still think it's a good idea to put electricity through the brain, but it's a significant number still think that. I think they ought to organize research to demonstrate that what they're doing is effective before they um, continue. <laughs> to finish with the World Health Organization, United Nations, um, as a repeat really of what they said separately over the years, they've now come together to say it more loudly um, I'll end with the widespread, this, is, this fits with what um, a new script is going on about and PPR is going on about, the widespread human rights violations and harm caused by mental health systems has led to a legacy of trauma that impacts many individuals and communities and spans generations. And then you think of Lisa's story and the, the children and, and etc. Some of the most upsetting stories coming in from our survey are adult kids now talking about when mum came home from having had ECT, the intergenerational effects. Most countries have not challenged long-standing biomedical approaches and the compulsory treatment orders. Thank you. <laughs>